testing phase was probably like two to three months where I was literally just testing, burning, trying to see how long the candles would actually last, trying to see which fragrances were really good and which ones weren't so great. Mm. And then there was another two to three months where like I was holding on to the candle. In September of 2020, today's guest launched a candle company. By February of 2021, she found her brand new company, Norlox Candle Co., listed as one of the top 25 candle companies by Oprah Magazine. Now, there's definitely a story about how she was able to make that happen. And if you're interested in hearing that story, as well as learning how she took her candle making hobby and turned it into a company that now has a flagship store in Seattle, Washington, keep on watching. Hi there, it's Sewa, and welcome to another episode of She's Off Script, where we help you create your own unique blueprint for business success. Before we dive into the conversation, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss our next episode. We release new ones every Thursday. With that, let's dive in. Kalina Bruce, welcome to She's Off Script. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So for anyone who hasn't come across you before, could you share who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my name is Kalina Bruce, and I am the CEO, founder, owner of Norlux Candle Bar, and we are in um, Belltown, Lower Queen Anne area in Seattle, Washington. Ah, so why candles? What led you to get involved in candles? (laughs) Yeah, so um, my story is a little bit non-traditional. I actually was in the nonprofit sector for over 15 years, primarily in education. Um, And during the pandemic, we moved from, you know, meeting in person, being with our scholars and families to being on Zoom all the time. Um, That was a huge shift for me. I'm a pretty extroverted person. And so um, I found myself kind of lighting a candle every day just to kind of start my day. Um, And that led me to have a curiosity around like how to make candles, Mm. um, which led me to think about a side hustle. So I was like, oh, okay. I told my husband I wanted to sell like 10 to 15 candles a month. Um, And it kind of went from there. Candle business launched online, went really well and um, moved into doing like candle making classes. And then that's where my will started turning about a candle bar. So So I know in 2021, you were featured in O Magazine's I was, uh, list. Yeah. Right. So at that point, you were relatively young as a company, new as a company. Yeah, How did that even we happen? Um, so, yeah, we were super new. We had just launched in September. Mm-hmm. We were fe- uh, featured in February. So wow, um, it was pretty crazy. Honestly, it was kind of like, I guess, guerrilla marketing. Um, I was... Going through all these, I was constantly seeing these like lists of features of like candles you should buy for Valentine's or candles you should buy for the holidays or whatever. And so I was like, how do I get on these lists? And Mm. so I basically just like went to every single article that I saw and I wrote down the name of the editor on the article and I just sent them an email. You know, if I could find them, if I could find their email address or if I could find their Instagram information or whatever, I would reach out to them and I'd be like, Hey, you know, like I'm, I want to be your candle lady, you know, can I send you some candles and you know, yada, yada, yada. So one particular person, um, she actually wrote for a number of different, um, you know, journals and magazines and things. So I didn't know specifically who she was the writer for, um, but she accepted my offer for me to send her some candles. And I sent her some candles. I never heard from her. So I was just kind of like, okay, you know, whatever. But I literally had sent out, you know, probably like 10 to 15, which was a lot because I was giving these candles away. And I was That's, that was your kid. month allotment. Yeah, right. So mm-hmm. I was like, okay. But the way I thought about it was like, I'm not paying for marketing and advertising right now. So I I'm going to consider this like an in-kind, you know, marketing mm. or advertising mm-hmm. budget. Um, so anyways, long story short, um, maybe a couple weeks later, I, I was like literally on Google every day, like searching Norlux to see if anything would pop up. And one day it said, oh, magazine. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it <laughs> <So> worked. <laughs> I clicked on it and it was the lady that I had sent candles to. And, I, and her email was like, you know, it was a generic, like, 
maybe like iHeartMedia or something like that. So again, I had no idea that she was a writer for O Magazine and she liked the candles and she featured us and she still orders candles from me today, which is really cool. So That's how you know that your candles are good. Yeah, every time she orders, I'm like, oh my God, is this for, you know, but I think she just likes them. She's ordering for herself. (laughs) You never know. Maybe O herself has used them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Now talking about sales, I wonder how long did it take you to go from the idea of this is going to be a business to your first uh-huh. customer? Um, I would say I was actually pretty fortunate. So um, my first launch, I sold out of everything that I had in stock. Um, and that was literally like before anyone even smelled any candles. So hmm. I would just say like, I have a really dope like village and tribe who was like, okay, girl, are you selling candles? <laughs> We're going to we'll buy support. your candles. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, It was literally, it was a complete shift from what I had been doing, which was, you know, what I was still doing at the time, which was being an educator. Mm. Um, And so, you know, people were like, okay, yeah, we'll support you. Mm. Um, But then once they actually got the candles, they're like, oh, these are good, you know? And so it kind of went from there. But I would say that's not everybody's journey and that's Mm -hmm. not everybody's story. And a lot of times it takes a while just to like acquire your customers and figure out who your customers base is Mm -hmm. and really try to narrow down like your target audience and all of that. And so I did that kind of after. Um, So I guess my my journey was a little bit like, like I said, it's non-traditional, but that piece of it was maybe a little bit backwards. So like after I started to sell, my focus was on continuing to acquire and sustain Mm. my customers and try to get repeat customers, but also try to, you know, broaden my customer base. So that's actually when I went into like my whole business plan after that. Got it. Now, I assume there's a lot of trial and error before you felt comfortable giving your candles to people. So what did that phase look like? How many candles did you actually make? And, um, you know, how many spoiled batches were there before you said you said this is the one I'm going to go with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, A lot of times people will say like six months to a year is really like the amount of time that I will take for candle testing. Mm. I think it just depends on how you produce your candles and the sorts of materials. So I would say with wooden wicks, you can test a lot faster than with a traditional cotton wick. Mm -hmm. Um, With the traditional cotton wicks, like there's so many different like sizes and like different wicks perform differently in different bases of wax. So like you have your soy wax, you have paraffin wax, you have blends, you have all these different things. Whereas with your wooden wick, there's like a few different sizes. They're pretty much like produced to perform really well in particular sorts of waxes. So Mm. um, it didn't take me as long to do the testing um, in terms of like, I was using just one uh, size vessel, which was a nine ounce vessel. It was your standard straight side vessel, which performed really well with like your standard wick. Mm -hmm. Um, Once I started looking at like different sizes and, you know, different fragrances and stuff like that, then that, you know, you always have to test, test, test before you send it out because you're sending out a little fire into somebody's house, you know? Um, But I would say I did my, my testing phase was probably like two to three months where I was literally just testing, burning, trying to see how long the candles would actually last trying to see which fragrances were really good and which ones weren't so great. Mm. And then there was another two to three months where like I was holding on to the candles. Like I literally like had them and like I'd give them to friends or like, you know, I have kids, I'd have a birthday party. Actually, it was my son's birthday party in August of 2020 where I had the most amount of candles that I had made. And people were like, oh my gosh, these are so good. When are you going to start selling them? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. And one of my friends was like, girl, you're ready, sell the candles. I'll buy one right now. Mm. And so my friends and family started buying candles. That was August 27th and we launched on September 7th. And yeah, the rest was history. So I think that's important too, just like having, like I said, your tribe, your village, who's like, you got this, you know, who will give you their honest opinion. Cause they would have told me too, if those candles were stinky, Mm -hmm. you know? You need those (laughs) kinds of people in your tribe. Yeah, for sure. So I'm curious, how much capital, how much money did it take to get you through that trial and error period where you figured out, okay, it's now ready to sell? 
Yeah. Um, so I would say when I first started, again, we're in the midst of the pandemic. There's no happy hours. There's mm-hmm. no Starbucks, right? So that I took my Starbucks and happy hour money and invested it in candle making. So I probably took, you know, about $500 of, you know, just a couple months of not doing my things. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, okay, I'm going to buy as many supplies as I can and just kind of see how it goes. And I got like the, you know, bare minimum. I think when you're ordering um, supplies and materials, obviously when you're ordering in bulk, you're going to see those, you know, prices go down a little bit more. But when you're ordering like 10 instead of 100, the price is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think I started with about $500 worth of stuff and probably like 10 fragrances and, um, like I said, one sort of vessel and all that. And then once I started selling, that's when I started to kind of expand and then start to order up in terms of ordering in bulk. Got it. So where did you find your manufacturers? I'm guessing you had to go to different places for fragrances, vessels, wax, yeah. or wholesalers um, rather than manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. There were wholesalers, vendors. Um, initially, I was just kind of doing research on like best practice, you know, like, you know, you don't want to like you could go to like Hobby Lobby or you can go to Michael's or you can go, you know, craft mm. stores and get stuff. But I was like, okay, if I'm going to be, you know, taken seriously, I want to use like professional things. Mm-hmm. And I was really focused on eco-friendly stuff as well, like clean fragrances that are not toxic. And so yeah. that's kind of where I started was like finding vendors who um, produce um, fragrances that don't have phthalates in them and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, Google, <laughs> going online, finding stuff, and then trying different things. Um, I think that like, it's good to try like in the beginning to try like three or four different vendors and see Mm -hmm. how you like them. And then you may find that you're like more loyal to one vendor than the other, but you also may find that like the price point looks different here, or especially if you can find things locally, um, you know, you cut costs on shipping and stuff like that. So, um, I do, I still do a lot of sourcing, um, depending on what I'm working on. Um, like if there's a specific project that requires something that I don't have, I start the sourcing, you know, process all over. But for the most part, I work with like two or three specific vendors. Mm. And so have you been able to settle on one standard line or are you constantly releasing different lines? And how does that impact your bottom line as far as making profit if you're always switching up? Yeah, that's a great question. I, when I first started, I had five um, different scents. Mm -hmm. Um, And then now I'd say we probably have like a hundred different scents in our inventory in terms of what you can order online. Mm -hmm. Everything is made to order. Mm -hmm. But um, what I'll do is if I come out with a new collection, there will be like five to 10 different scents or fragrance combinations in that collection. That collection will be themed. So based on a specific season or different event or something like that. And then, um, what I used to do is just like, keep every, like, you know, anytime I would make something, I love it. So I'd be like, okay, I'm going to keep this forever, you know, but (laughs) you start to find that certain fragrances, you know, maybe do well during different times of the year or like something that I really love maybe doesn't resonate with, you know, other folks. And so, um, what I try to do is like phase things out in the collection and replace it with something new rather than like constantly adding more and more, because then you're like, oh, is playing catch up basically. Mm. Um, And then in our candle bar, we have over a hundred different fragrances. So people can come in and create their own custom blends. So they have the option to purchase something pre-batch. They have the option to come in and make something. Um, Or I had a customer come in yesterday. He comes in like once a month and he's like, you know, I love this particular candle and they don't make this candle anymore. Can you replicate it? So I'll try to like figure out the notes in that candle and make it for him. You're about to see me in your store. (laughs) Yeah. You can bring in whatever you can bring in your own vessels. Obviously it's kind of up to our discussion. We'll test it and see if Mm -hmm. it will be good for burning. Um, But um, yeah, we have people bring in their own vessels and make their own candles and stuff like that. So 
I love that. But speaking of your candle bar, so you made yeah. the transition from your kitchen to a physical location in Seattle. Now yes. we both live here. Seattle is expensive. So oh, yeah. how did you justify <laughs> the cost of brick and mortar? Because most people are going straight to e-commerce and that's where they're staying. For sure. And I think in the beginning, a lot of folks like tried to encourage me to just stay with e-commerce. Mm. Um, and I did get discouraged a couple of times about opening a brick and mortar. I was like, you know, maybe this is stupid. Like, this isn't a good idea. Like, I have a good job. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at um, Seattle University and I was both teaching there and was in a directorship position. And so um, I had a stable, you know, job that I had been at for seven years before leaving. And so um, it really, for me, there were a couple of things. So that's, like I said, when I got into like really looking at a business plan and justifying, you know, what I'm doing and why it works and how I could see it growing. Um, I did financial projections. So I looked at, you know, what um, I was currently bringing in and what I thought I could do. I thought that I could either double or triple my income by coming into a brick and mortar. The reason for that is a couple of things. So first of all, if you think about yourself as a candle buyer, right? If you see a candle online, right? You might look at it and you're like, oh, that sounds like it would smell good, but I'm not sure, mm -hmm. you know, like I want to smell it to see, you know, what it's giving. Right. And so, um, a lot of times people are more inclined to buy something in person, a candle mm -hmm. in person because they want to smell it. Yeah. And so I was finding that like, when people were placing orders online, they'd order like one or two or like a very curious person might order like a discovery set that has like four or six, but they're ordering the small ones, mm -hmm. you know? Whereas like when I was doing vendors markets, they'd be like, oh my God, this smells good and this smells good. And just give me all of these. That you know? would be so me. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. If I get my product in front of people more often, they're going to buy more candles. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing. Secondly, I was looking at my space as a as multiple streams of income, right? So you have you can come in and buy pre-batch candles. You can come in and make your own candles. Our space is also a venue that you can rent out. So you can do different sorts of events that are not candle related, or you can do private candle making sessions. Mm. We also go on site. So we can bring everything to you and we can do candle making that way. Um, and then we also just want it to be a community hub. So people were working with like other small businesses or nonprofit organizations that need like meeting space or different things like that. And so, yeah, just basically looking at it as a form of like multiple streams of income. And I kept going back to like, can I continue to do this from my kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, from my dining room? I'm taking up all that. We literally turned our dining room into a factory, you know? Um, and ultimately I was like, no, the what I'm doing is bigger than just selling candles. And I have to, my faith has to be greater than my fear. Mm -hmm. So I am stepping out. And then once I got here, I was like, all right, God, <laughs> I show quit me. my job. Show me how good it can get. <laughs> Come on, I'm being faithful. Right. Um, and it's been really good. It's been a super positive response. Um, we are moving and doing doing well. We've been able to expand since we've been here. Um, growing the staff from just myself to now almost 10 staff members. Wow. So doing really well. That's amazing to hear. Now, Thank oftentimes you. when people create those projections in their business plans, sometimes it's just based on, you know, guess yeah, and hope. How have your sure. projections held up? Um, I've, I've actually exceeded my projections. I will say um, I was very fortunate when mm -hmm. I was, before I wanted to open a brick and mortar, I actually had joined or I had been accepted into a business accelerators program. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that program, I got five coaches who worked with me to really think about my business plan, my model. Um, and so in order for me to be a part of that program, I had to come up with some milestones that I wanted to meet. So one was coming up with the business plan. One was financial projections. One was coming up with a marketing plan. So there were all these different things. And so I got to work. One of my mentors, one of my coaches was actually like in finance. And so we did a very, very basic projection, mm -hmm. which was like, 
you know, just enter some stuff in the Excel sheet and then multiply it by this and spread it out basically. Um, but then we kind of went back and he was the one who was like, okay, so again, if you're in person, if you have a brick and mortar, people are coming in, how do you think your sales would grow? And I was like, oh, I think we could scale two to three times. So that's kind of how we came up with the numbers. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just hired a new accounting team. So they're actually going to look at the original financial projections, look at where we are now and see, you know, we're doing projections for the next three to five years now, Mm -hmm. but yeah, we definitely exceeded, um, my little projections. I love to hear (laughs) that. I I love to hear that. So what about financing? Are you all self-funded? Because it does take a while or it does take some funding to get into a brick and mortar space. Oftentimes yeah. they're asking for a year in advance, maybe even two, depending on the climate. Right. Yeah. Um, so I did take out a small business loan in order to um, build out the space. So I think when, so one of the things that I was really fortunate was to get a space that, you know, I was the first occupant of. Um, however, I severely underestimated what that would cost to build out. So that business accelerators program that I was a part of um, resulted in a grant, a $10,000 grant. And so when I got the grant, I was like, okay, I have my money. I'm going to open my brick and mortar. And so I came in and we started doing like, you know, I brought in like a, a contractor and designer. And when they came back with the budget, it was like 60 to $80,000. And I was like, what you know that Seattle like, tax? Woo. I'm like, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> How do we get from ten thousand? And so they were like, well, you're in a brand new space. There's no outlets mm-hmm. on the wall. There's no electrical. Like electrical alone is going to be anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand wow. dollars just to put sockets on the wall and to put you know lights and all this stuff. And mm-hmm. that's not including you know your fixtures and you know your actual like aesthetic, you mm-hmm. know. And so. Um, we were able to bring that number down a lot. Um, and, you know, I ended up sourcing a lot of things myself. Like my designers would come up with ideas and I'd be like, okay, I can find something similar on, you know, at World Market mm-hmm. or on Overstock. You That's know, that like elbow there was grease certain... at this point. Let me help, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I can cut the cost by sourcing things myself. Um, and then the other thing was, so at that time I was still working full time. I was still running the business online full-time and now I'm sourcing a whole build out. Um, but you know, there were certain things that were kind of non-negotiables. Like I wanted there to be like a statement, like chandelier when you came in. So that one, you know, we spent a little bit more money on, but then our other chandeliers maybe came from Amazon or Overstock. So it was really just kind of like, you know, it took more time to source, but we were able to cut costs that way. Um, but yeah, I was able to get a, a loan through uh craft. Uh, C3, which is a small business um, or which is a nonprofit that offers loans to small businesses at um, very low interest uh, rates. Okay. Um, so we kind of locked in at a really good interest rate and yeah, it worked out in my favor. So that's great to hear. So what's next for Nora Lux Candle Co.? Oh, um, I don't know, girl. I'm stressed <laughs> out. It's like, no, it's going well. It's been good. I'm really trying to grow the team, mm-hmm. focus on growing the team right now. Um, we've been doing a lot of off-site things and a lot of corporate things. And so mm-hmm. really want to kind of give some specific attention to our corporate clients um, because they're inviting us out to do, you know, either candle making or vending or things like that. And so working on that. Um, we have some kind of bigger projects that are coming down the line. So we we can't talk about them just yet, but we will be kind of wrapping up for those. And we're really excited to be able to present those to you all when, when we can. Um, and then people keep asking if there's going to be another location. And I'm not quite sure if I would open another location in Seattle, but um, I'm really interested in the concept of like doing some pop-ups around in different states. And mm-hmm. so um, I know I'll be doing a pop-up in Vegas at some point. I have family out there. I've been nice. Talking to someone in Philly. So really just kind of thinking about what that looks like to be able to kind of pop up, um, you know, in different states and do candle bars at different um, events. So stay tuned. So for anyone who does want to follow your journey, where can we find you? Where can we buy? Where can we follow you? 
Yeah, for sure. So first and foremost, you can always come into our brick and mortar. Um, we're located uh, Lower Queen Anne, Belltown area, really close to Climate Pledge Arena. Um, our address is 3020 Warren Place. A lot of times people go to Warren Avenue, which is like seven minutes north of us. So Warren Place in between First and Denny. Um, in our candle bar, you can come in and have a whole candle making experience. And so when you come in, you get to pick out your vessels. Um, it's a guided process. So we walk you through like picking out your fragrances and pouring your candle and naming your candle and all of that fun stuff. Um, and it's really also just an opportunity to like practice some self-care and just have some time. Um, and then we have a retail space, our apothecary, which is right next door to our candle bar, which you can come in and purchase pre-batched candles. Those are also, or our space also features items that are um, curated by Black vendors. And that's very intentional. We're just trying to share shelf space. So if you are a Black vendor looking for shelf space, um, we purchase wholesale. Um, and if you are looking to have a one-stop shop to buy and support Black vendors, you can come in to our space. And then you can also find us on social media. Um, all of our socials are Norlux Candle Co. And um, we use our social media to try to inform and educate. Um, so just kind of, you know, anybody who's interested in all things candle making, whether it's like, I can't keep my wick lit or, you know, I'm interested in like selling at vendors markets. What does that look like? Or I'm interested in working with a corporate client. Do you have any tips? Like we just try to use our space. We don't want to be gatekeepers mm. in the candle making sector. We want to share knowledge. And in, in general, in, you know, being a black woman, I think it's important. Like there's just a lot of things that I didn't know that I didn't know, mm. you know? So I think it's important to kind of put that out there. Um, and we're also always highlighting other businesses of color um, on our page. So if you're ever interested in like finding, like yesterday we, we, highlighted a black winemaker who's Ooh. in um washington state and um so we like to highlight other folks who are just doing amazing things so we can send people their way as well if you enjoyed my conversation with kalina i want you to know we have over 180 audio podcast episodes just like this one you can enjoy on she's or anywhere else audio podcasts are available before you leave don't forget to subscribe and share this episode with someone else who needs the inspiration to build their own business with that we'll See you right back here next week for another episode. Bye.